thanks everybody for joining. I know this is the end of the day. Uh, my name is Nick Salzman. I lead partnerships at OneSignal. I'm happy to host this panel today with two friends of mine, David and Seth. So we're excited to talk a little bit about user journeys. So um, quick introduction on OneSignal. We are the most widely used mobile messaging platform out there. So about one in seven mobile apps use us every day to engage with our customers. So I'm excited to talk a little bit today about how customers of ours are basically leveraging this on a daily basis and, and what are the best strategies that we're seeing throughout the industry. So I'll let everybody introduce themselves to kick it off. For an icebreaker though, please also let us know what is your favorite subscription app that you use on a weekly basis. And rap chat cannot count as one of them. <laughs> so David, I'll let you kick it off. All right, I'm David, developer advocate at Revenue Cat. Uh, my favorite app is uh, Class Jojo, actually. <laughs> They're a Revenue Cat customer. I actually had uh, somebody from the product team on the podcast, uh, also run a, a podcast called Sub Club. And uh, it is just a delightful app. My kids have gone to different preschools, and the app in the other preschools was just terrible, <laughs> like abjectly horrible experience. And Class Dojo is just delightful. Like, it, it's a fantastic app. Like, I actually got a notification just a little while ago, like, hey, there's no school tomorrow. I get pictures of my son um, playing with his friends during school. And it's, it's a delightful app and creates a great um, parent-teacher interaction. And so I think, I don't know, my wife subscribes. So I think we pay him like 60 bucks a year. I don't even know what the like premium <laughs> features are, but it's such a great app. So I love it. That's um, awesome. And then I've been in the app industry since 2008, like founded my com company days after Steve Jobs announced the original iPhone SDK. So I've been around the block, launched something like 20 apps, uh, sold three of them, uh, started working on subscriptions and uh, was beating my head against subscription uh, infrastructure bugs. So our monthly subscription wasn't renewing properly um, and tons of like support headaches. And then my engineers was like, you know, guys, we gotta work on the product. We gotta improve the product. And they're like, we gotta fix these bugs. And so I ended up uh, working, uh, installing Revenue Cat into my app. And then one thing led to another, and I actually joined Revenue Cat uh, as developer advocate. So I still run apps on the side. My apps suck right now. Don't go look at them in the app store. It's embarrassing. Um, but now at Revenue Cat, you know, we, we provide uh, SDKs to manage transactions inside the app so you can trust our code to uh, actually make that purchase event and collect the receipt and then send it to our server side. And then server side, uh, we provide a full backend infrastructure to become your single source of truth for subscription status you know, who um, is entitled to what things. And then we also push that data out to OneSignal and uh, AppsFlyer. And we have, I think, 30 plus integrations now so that you have that, that normalized data across iOS, Android, the web. Uh, we're soon launching Amazon App Store. Uh, and so you have all of that data normalized. And it's really important for OneSignal and other CRM. And, and we're going to talk a little bit about like customer journeys. Super important to have that data normalized across all the platforms because in Android, a free trial is a little different and the billing grace periods are a little different than they are on iOS and they are on Stripe. Uh, so we normalize all that across the different stores and then push it to all the different integrations, do ETLs so you can send it to a, a data warehouse and things like that. Uh, so yeah, that's yeah. a little bit about me and Revenue Cat. Awesome. Well, Seth, what's your favorite app subscription-wise? Let's see. I mean, it's got to be Spotify, I think. Okay. Uh, I love Spotify. Discover Weekly. Uh, Playlist is amazing. Now I do my podcast there. So, I, I mean, I definitely use Spotify the most. But I will give an honorable mention to Auto Sleep, which is like a sleeping watch sleep app, if anyone knows what I'm talking about. It's like the most beautiful charts. I don't think it's healthy. I check it, like, as soon as I wake <laughs> up and usually feel like shit if it's, like, in the red. But... Um, yeah, I just got to give a shout to that app. Um, That's good. But yeah, I'm Seth. I'm the founder and CEO of Rap Chat. Uh, Rap Chat is the easiest way to make music on your phone. So we have an iOS and Android app um, and some function functionality on web. And basically give music makers everything they need in one app to create a song. So we have 
uh, hundreds of thousands of beats that are uploaded from producers. Uh, we have 10 million plus users on the platform to date. Um, that can collaborate with one another, and then all sorts of other fun, like social stuff in there. But um, yeah, I've been on the the journey uh, for several years now, and still here, so it must be going <laughs> all right. But uh, yeah, excited to chop it up today. Yeah. yeah well, well, thanks so much for joining. Uh, my favorite sub subscription app is The Athletic. If any of you are oh, sports fans, yeah. that is probably the best source of sports news out there. So. I'll have to check out the sleep app. That sounds fun as well. I don't know. My wife's telling me to delete it because she doesn't make us healthy. But. <laughs> Leave it alone. Yeah. Um, well, cool. Well, uh, to open us up, I think, Seth, you know, we, we talked a little bit about how you have so many different types of users, right? Yeah. That, that you're thinking about. I and mean, all the different types of users have different interests. Uh, they came to the app for different types of things. And you've thought a lot about how to improve the onboarding experience, right? And the different ways that you're thinking about you know, how do you introduce them to different subscription types or how do you engage with them once they download the app? Can you talk a little bit about kind of what you've thought about over the past year as it relates to onboarding and the different types of user journeys that you're creating? Yeah, I mean, I think one has just been, I mean, it's just difficult. Like, you know, a lot of our growth is organic and so we get all sorts of different types of creators <laughs> in different demographics. So. Um, I think step one was just even getting to the point where it's like, okay, a creator's not just someone that like makes a song. Like, you know, I think for a couple years we just thought, okay, you make a song, like you're a creator, you're activated, you know, what's your retention? Like, it's like, no, 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 there's like 10 different versions of that. And, um, you know, one person might come in and just want to like record for fun and, you know, share it with their friends in college. And then another person comes in and spends like hours in the studio perfecting their craft, doing multiple sessions and not finishing it until like two weeks later. So um, yeah, the project at Concept from the previous talk was like kind of similar to the way he showed that graph is, is similar to ours. So anyway, to get back to your like question, um, we just updated our onboarding like six months ago to just ask a a lot more questions around like what type of creator they are, what they're here to do. I mean, even, you know, their demographics, how did they hear about the app? And that was a huge, um, that's been a huge win. I mean, we're still like, there, there's so many gems to mine there. Um, but now we're able to, yeah, basically like, I mean, it's a big ass project, but we're starting to do journeys based off of each type of creator. Um, you know, are they beginner, are they advanced? If they're advanced, maybe they're more likely to pay for like the more advanced features. Um, so it's just been kind of a big overhaul and a big project and a lot of it is just getting the data between different platforms to talk to each other. So it's just like a lot of gritty work. Uh, but once, you know, we're almost at a pretty good spot where we can just start rapidly experimenting um, and that's kind of the next step. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess just it's a work in progress. It, it is like hard to do well, but yeah. putting the investment in like good data um, and even just like customer interviews and discovery. Like I, you know, was talking to users last week um, and learned a lot from that. So yeah, it's just, it's a, it's a crazy project, but it's fun. And once we started segmenting, um, which I guess is kind of obvious, but once we really did that, like it just, there's so many light bulbs and like now we have experiments per kind of segment. Yeah, that makes all the sense. Yeah. David, you, you sit at like this intersection of the data, right? That's yeah. what I was talking about. Like without getting the right data, you can actually do the segmentation. So how important is normalizing and getting all of your data correct in your application to do the segmentation, to do the creative experiments that you actually want to do through different messaging channels or, or other ways that you're engaging with your customers? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's super important. I mean, you know, if you're gonna make data-driven decisions, you need to be able to rely on the data. And uh, our CEO just tweeted yesterday um, or this morning about another bug we found. And so we have 40 engineers working on this and we talk to Apple regularly and you know, we've been doing this for five years. You know, Revenue Cat was founded about five years ago. And the founder, the co-founders actually were working at uh, Elevate even before that. So it's like we have close to a decade of experience working in 
uh, subscription apps, and we're still finding weird little edge cases and bugs. And then, you know, at this point, we're we're processing close to two billion dollars of of uh, subscription revenue every year. And when you operate at that scale, you start seeing all the weird things that happen. No. Um, and so, <clears throat> and we work with some really big apps like Class Dojo, Bizco, TuneIn, and some other big apps. And you know, they have their own data teams internally. Who, uh, who are helping to find some of those issues. They're like, oh wait, this isn't matching up. And so we find another you know, thing that's going on with Apple receipts and then uh, you know, Google is moving to version five of their billing system and that's a huge change that's gonna dramatically shift what data you can and can't get. And so you know, we have a whole team working on that. And so yeah, getting the, the data right um, and then being able to get that data to the right places to make decisions and analyze the data is a huge lift. And you know, it's not rocket science. You know, we're not we're not like you know crazy brilliant AI engineers or anything. But it's just a lot of work, and then it's a lot of scale to figure out all those crazy things that are happening uh, that you just don't know unless you operate at that scale. So you know, you might if you're a small developer and you're losing you know five percent of your uh, retention campaigns aren't even getting fired because there's like some weird, you know, receipt issue. Yeah. It's like you might not even realize it, but when you're Visco, that's a huge difference, and that's a lot of money if five percent of your, you know, reengagement campaigns aren't firing. Uh, so yeah, getting that that data platform layer right is is incredibly important. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, from our perspective, we see about 11 billion messages sent across the ecosystem every day, and one of the biggest things that we notice is people are not figuring out who to target, right? They're just spraying basically all their users in a lot of ways, and it's great, right? Like every channel, every user, let's just hit them with all the updates, right? And, and something will stick. But the reality is that every user is different, and if you can start with basic segmentation and just leverage the data that's already being generated by your app or by your subscription that somebody's opted into, you can get a much deeper relationship with those users. Um, and so I guess taking the context a little further, like what are the KPIs that you guys are looking at for you, know, you guys on the subscription side? Like what, what are the big KPIs that you think are important for retention? And then Seth, how does that, does that matter to your business? How does it differ? Right? I think everybody matters, everybody measures different metrics, mm -hmm. but those are kind of the key KPIs that every business is looking at. And I'm, I'm curious if that's yeah. changed over the past year. Um, yeah, so I'll kick this off and then you yeah. can go practical. Um, so we're, we're, we're in the middle of a pretty big data project at RevenueCat uh, to start sharing benchmarks. So we've got 15,000 apps on the platform. Like I said, we're managing over $2 billion a year of, or close to $2 billion a year of subscription revenue. Uh, and so we're finally have a data scientist, have the team in place to start sharing insights. And as we started sharing insights, honestly, it's kind of depressing. <laughs> and yeah. Seth and I were talking about that. So you know the median annual, the median first year retention uh, for an annual subscription is twenty seven percent. So you know sixty three percent of your users or seventy three percent of your users are churning within that first year. Like that, that's not a great way to run a business. Um, and so, so you know I think a lot of people are thinking very short term and using KPIs like. Um, you know, even some of the talks today were like, you know, let's show the paywall more, let's get more free trials started. And you need to do those things and you need to get cash flow into the business. But in, you know, thinking about what we we're gonna talk about on this panel, um, I think a lot of subscription apps should, should be looking at like two year retention as, as their KPI. Like you need a lot of other KPIs to be able to get to that, but, Two-year retention is when you know, somebody's probably gonna stick around for the long haul. They're, they're really actually getting value. Uh, Eric Crowley was sharing earlier, if y'all were here for the first session, about tourists versus locals. So like, you can get a bunch of tourists into your app. Like, you can spend a ton of money on Facebook or you know, use some growth hacks or whatever, and you can get those people to start a free trial you know, using all the different techniques that we've talked about today. But what's going to get them to year two is actually delivering. And then, you know, speaking to like customer journeys, it's aligning your customer journeys around them actually getting value in the app. 
So I was talking to Sylvain, uh, who works at Babel, and he was joking about, you know, how, you know, some of their retention stuff is just so simplistic. Like you were talking about, it's like, hey, re remember we're here, and like, hey, resubscribe. And, and what you really need to be doing is, is re-engaging people into the value, because that's what's going to get them to year two. Like, yeah, you might get them to open the app again. Yeah, you might hit your, you know, weekly or monthly active user numbers if you can push one more notification that just opens the app. But what's really going to get them to year two is re-engaging them with the value of the app and then building a valuable app. And so if, if you're only looking at a lot of short-term stuff, which you do need to be, um, but if you're only looking at that, you're, you're kind of missing out on building, on finding the locals of like optimizing all of these things that we talked about around getting them to that two-year point versus like just getting that free trial start or just getting that free trial conversion. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think I, I like to look at the analogy of if I'm a friend and I haven't talked to you in two years and then I hit you up randomly on, yeah. on a day, <laughs> hey, come hang out with me. You probably aren't likely to, to come hang out, right? But if you actually have a constant communication, you create a relationship, you provide value, right? You, you can actually keep someone around and, and keep them as a friend for a long time. So I think that constant communi communication is really key. Um, and Seth, is, is that true for your business as well? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think we have a unique challenge where we were a free app for years. And so we were like really like a kind of a content UGC social app. Um, and then we turned on subscriptions like a couple years ago. And um, like it's it's been going well, like we're, we're still here. We're doing like pretty well. But at the same time, what we're finding is there's just so much like untapped value still in our base that might not even be year two subscription retention, but might be year two creator retention. Um, and so we're still trying to figure out like, you know, I guess the monetization model for that, because it is kind of, you know, you have your like engagement retention, um, just general product health KPIs, and then you have your subscription KPIs. And so, um, you know, we're looking at, at both and just trying to figure out like, you know, how do we monetize the people that you know, are, are all green in these KPIs, but maybe not like converted or, you know, start a trial, but didn't feel like the premium was, you know, good enough, but are still here using it every day. Like these are things that, you know, we view as opportunities, I guess. Um, but yeah, I mean, I agree with, with Dave in the sense like, you know, a lot of the top of funnel, even like day zero events can be like super misleading if you don't follow that through. So even if you, you know, our trial start rate was pretty healthy and then we looked at like, you know, the amount of billing errors that happened after they, yeah. for the people that churned, it was like super high percentage of the involuntary churn was billing errors. And then we like explored it and talked to them and they're like, yeah, like I literally like don't have enough money for this and like shit, okay, like, you know, but they still love the product. so. Um, yeah, I think you, you have to look beyond just even, you know, obviously trials and onboarding, like it, you know, or paywalls and onboarding, everyone that's tried this experiment sees the numbers go up, but like what are the residual effects, you know, because one thing we're thinking about again is like, okay, we show like our, you know, best paywall and like the option we want, which would be like an annual, but then what about the people that like, you know, had intent to purchase that opt into a trial that cancel that trial, but then that still use the product. Like, did we miss an opportunity to have a better subscription product for them lower in the funnel that would have bigger retention, you know? So, um, yeah, I mean, we track all those. I think it's just about like one thing, like the metrics that we're starting to look at is just trying to blend both subscription KPIs and like value KPIs. So, and then figure out the people that are not you know, subscribers, how do we get that percentage up? Because like we just, we have a lot of really engaged, healthy creators and we'd like to see, you know, the subscriber percentage look more like a Spotify or something. Yeah, but it, but it also comes back to, I think we were talking about this earlier, like how much do people have to pay, right? I think we're in an economy where, yeah. oh. you know, people don't have as much money to spend on subscription apps, right? And maybe there's other you know, ways that you can actually feed a great value, but also monetize your application. 
Um, I don't know how many of you guys are, have experienced this, but I now get ads, right, within kind of the subscription model, this hybrid world that we're in. And I know we were talking about this earlier, Seth, you thought a little bit about that because your users are active, right? You yeah. know that they want to be there, but they're not churning because they don't like the app, they're churning because they can't pay. And so how do you figure out, you know, how to inject that into conversations, but also how do you communicate that and put people on different journeys to experience, you know, the still best in breed parts of your application, um, but, you know, have another way to actually fuel that, that growth? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, just as an example, I was talking to a user like the other week that like a year ago bought an annual and he's like, oh, I was all in for the gold, but then like, you know, I had to cancel it for a month to like pay my bills, but then I just re-upped to the monthly. So then he switched to the monthly and I was just like, man, that's like obviously like super sad too. Like the economy's like really hitting our segment, our persona is like hard, but um, it was just interesting even hearing like how he viewed an annual subscription wasn't like, I don't know, how we would maybe view like getting a discount on a calm annual subscription. He was like, oh, this is like 50 bucks versus, you know, 10 or five. And so um, I do think, of course, like it, it's, it's a lot of price exploration that we, we need to do um, and maybe even like subscription mix and maybe even like I saw some interesting talks around like IEPs versus subscriptions and then you're bringing up ads. I think for us, like one thing that is uh, definitely an opportunity is like looking at, we do challenges. So we're starting to do like sponsored challenges. So we'll bring in brands um, and then an artist. And then we do this like big promotion, like, you know, rap with Kanye West. I'm kidding, we don't have Kanye, but you know, maybe in the future, <laughs> but we are getting big artists. And like, um, you know, that's kind of a way to generate revenue and still like, we're very much of the belief, kind of like I've heard this about like Duo too, like you can get most of the stuff for free. Like we don't want to restrict people from making music. Like we only want you to pay if you want to upgrade your experience and you know, obviously you have the means to do it. So um, for those people that, you know, aren't upgrading, things like challenges and um, I mean, ads are kind of like the OG way to do that, but there, there are ways to basically, um, help them drive your business and still add value. And so we're just trying not to throw in like an ads SDK and like get a little more creative. Um, but, you know, it's, it's all up for grabs right now. Yeah, and, and how important is that communication to your users then? You're basically just leveraging your user base and bringing them back to different experiences. You know, like you talked about earlier, that segmentation was key. You don't want to yeah. show people that you know, don't like Kanye, Kanye stuff, that's, you know, a, a pretty niche example, but how are you leveraging that segmentation to reach the right users? Yeah. Well, another example is like, um, we ask in onboarding, like, do you, like, is your music on Spotify or Apple Music? Like, do you distribute, you know, music is called distribution. Yeah. Do you distribute to Apple Music or Spotify? And, you know, we have a percentage of people that have answered yes. So, like, to me, that's not, because distribution is not, like, that's an expensive thing. Like, it costs money to get on there. It costs money to get in the studio. Like, that's a kind of a big deal, you know? Um, and so, f I guess through that data, like, we're doing some exploration on, like, all right, for that segment of users, like, obviously they're using our product, they're coming here for a reason. Like, what is, you know, maybe there's even a, a platinum tier above, like, what we call Rap Chat Gold for that group that, you know, maybe we do the distribution for them, or maybe we make it easier, or maybe we hook into that promotion flow. Um, so I think that's like, yeah, we see opportunities in the segments and especially like in that example, we know that they are actually paying money already, even not outside of our app to advance their music career. So how do we plug into that workflow, you know? Yeah, it makes sense. And the monetizing for users is something I've been thinking a ton about lately. And um, I'm actually working on a big update to my weather app and we're re we decided to pull ads from the weather app and we're gonna experiment with just a hard paywall. Like you cannot use the app uh, unless you start a subscription because the free uh, experience was terrible. I was, yeah. getting, I was getting bad reviews. I was getting customer support saying, hey, you're advertising guns in your app. And I had gone and like checked all the boxes. Like, 
you know, don't show this kind of ads, don't show adult ads, don't show, and of course, you make less money if you yeah. don't, but even then, it's like there was gun ads, there was uh, uh, casino ads, there was like, you know, like really annoying, like a uh, um, roulette wheel kind of animations and stuff that was totally taken away from the experience. Uh, so we're just gonna completely remove them, which I don't think long-term is actually a, a great thing to do, but there's just not another choice. So like, like request for startup here, I, I think it's a huge untapped opportunity in the subscription space of helping subscription app developers better monetize those free users. So like Seth is working, he hired somebody part-time to do partnerships where you're one-to-one -one as one app reaching out to one brand to do a sponsorship. There's got to be a way to, to, to better scale that across these premium subscription apps where you are delivering a ton of value. You, you know, it's, it's not a Twitter feed where your ad's going to end up. I mean, there was a whole thing about child pornography in the last like 24 hours that like brands are pulling their Twitter advertising because there was like solicitation of child porn on Twitter and their ads were showing up next to it. It's like yeah. that doesn't happen in a good subscription app. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but how you monetize those free users, the free engaged users, the people who love yeah. your app, who want to be there. And, you know, I mean, as an app developer myself, you know, putting that hat on, it's kind of fun, like working at Revenue Cat, but also still kind of running my app business. It's like, I want, you, I want to give people as much as I can. Like, I don't, I don't want to paywall the entire app. I want people to use it and experience it, but there just aren't great options right now. So I think that's, that's a huge thing, and especially you know, with, with potential recession, with inflation, with, with things getting tight, I think that's gonna be a huge area for experimentation, and then also a huge opportunity for somebody to come in and help solve that for developers. Yeah, I mean, we, we talk about it every day at, at OneSignal, but you, you're paying more and more to acquire your, your users. How do you actually engage with them? And yeah. then how do you think about other ways to cross-promote, use sponsorships? You've got to think creatively because mm -hmm. You know, you have this first party data, now you can engage with users. You, now you have all these channels to figure out how you want to engage with them. Um, but you've got to provide value at the end of the day, right? Yeah. And, and that's what it comes back to. Yeah. Um, and so I think one thing that I'm curious about is, have you seen any changes in user behavior over the past 12 months? Um, you know, you're communicating with their users, right? Have you noticed any differences? Um, you know, the economy's changing or with, with user preferences changing over the past 12 months? Um, so there's a trend that I thought was happening. Okay. And now, you know, I was able to talk to our data scientist. He pulled in like 60 million transactions over the last like six months. And I actually dug into this data like in May, uh, but I, I've been looking at it the last few days again. And what the trend I thought was happening was people starting a free trial and then immediately going into settings and turning off auto renew. Because it's a pattern we see. So in, in Revenue Cat, you've got a customer dashboard. You can actually see like minute by minute a timeline of their interactions with your subscription, which yep. so you know we ingest Apple's push notification or server to server notifications to maintain that timeline, but we also pull their servers to make sure that's accurate because their push notifications aren't always great. Um, so in those timelines, we were starting to see this like start a subscription and like three minutes later, turn off auto renew. And so I thought, oh wow, this is like a huge like trend. People are getting more sophisticated. People are turning off auto renew quicker. Uh, we dug into our data and looked at like 60 million cancellations and it's not a trend which I, I was surprised at. So it's actually just, it's pretty consistent. Um, but that is a place where I think it's a trend among developers to start getting more sophisticated about understanding auto renew um, because that's, that's like the biggest signal you have as a subscription app of intent. So, you know, if somebody goes into Rap Chat, mm -hmm. starts a free trial, they might not launch the app for another two weeks so you don't know inside the app, you, you know, you know maybe, okay, they didn't come back, um, but that auto renew is a huge signal. I was actually talking to like one of the biggest apps on the app store, huge data science team. Um, you know, they've spent the last few years with um, app tracking transparency, trying to figure out what's the earliest, most important signal that we can feed back to um, Facebook and other app platforms for optimization. 
And what they landed on was that auto oh, renew event. Know. So if, if somebody goes and starts a free trial and they immediately turn off auto renew or within the you know, first couple of days, you know, that's a huge signal that they're, they're just not gonna renew. So getting, and again, that's something we make really easy. Like we can push that unsubscribe event to one signal. Yeah. Um, and I think it's a mutual customer of ours. Zero is a fasting app uh, or intermittent fasting app. And I, I had this experience as a customer. I'd subscribed, use the app for a while. In May, my annual subscription was coming up. And it's like, you know, I'm just not using the app that much anymore. So I go to settings within Apple and I turn off auto renew. And before I could even switch to the mail app, I get, <laughs> I get a mail, uh, email from them saying, hey, we got your subscription, we got your cancellation request. They acknowledged you know, that I had canceled. Now, what Zero didn't do was like offer me a discount or anything like that. But what we're seeing is people getting more and more sophisticated using that auto renew event to trigger winbacks. And then you know, to what we were talking about earlier, is not just, don't just, I mean, the, the lowest hanging fruit is just money, right? So, you know, if you're just starting out, you don't have a lot of resources to build out sophisticated user journeys. The easiest thing to do is when somebody turns off auto renew, you know, message push them right it, away. Message them right away and say, you know, hey, 50% off. And the, the cool thing about that from like a, a product exploration standpoint is it tells you, is it money or is it not money? So, yeah. like you were talking about yeah. that user earlier who, just didn't have the money. And yeah. so when they hit that auto renew off, if you'd sent them a 50% off, the signal would be, hey, they're actually getting value here, but they can't afford it, or they're not getting enough value to stay subscribed at that same price. So like for zero, I like the app, I will probably use it some more. If they would offer me 50, I'm just not getting $60 a year worth of value. And so the cool thing about using that is it is also kind of a product signal. Like, are people canceling because they're not getting value, or are they canceling because they're not getting enough value? And so, getting more sophisticated about using that auto renew status, I think, is something more and more developers are exploring. And it is probably one of the lowest hanging fruit that you can do. Uh, again, if you don't have a super sophisticated team, you know, we make it super easy it gets pushed right to one signal yep. if, you, if you have the integration set up. Um, and so you always wanna be looking for that kind of low hanging fruit. And to me, that's one of the lowest hanging fruits. Yeah, it's an interesting observation. The fact that you can basically set up an automated journey where somebody cancels, you send them a message, you see their intent, if it's price, if it's not, if it's not price, then you send them another message, you figure out why, right? And you can create right. different branches for users depending on kind of those preferences. Um, so yeah, that's, that's pretty interesting. Seth, what's one observation you've seen this year amongst your users? <laughs> or one I, change, I guess. I was just last... thinking like, I, I'll get to that in a sec, but just related to what Dave's saying, like there's so many different journeys. <laughs> <laughs> so we have all these kind of queued up, like even different unsubscribe journeys and it's just, it is just a lot of work to get. So anytime you can kind of leapfrog or shortcut with tools, you should do that. But then still connecting the tools, like you just have to, I guess it's just taking longer than I wish to even yeah. like get rolling. Like I know there's all these micro journeys. So um, it's just, it just got me thinking. Um, <laughs> all right. Yeah. I mean, this year, I think for us, the big, yeah, the biggest thing was just like ability to, to pay like the intents there um but it's just you know i don't know i was talking to an investor and he said like you know for the first time like over 20 percent of the people couldn't pay their utility bill or something and like that's when and someone said i'm not an econ i'm not an economist either i'm just saying like that kind of hit me because i was like that's a lot of our like you know like the conversations i've had with our users i'm hearing similar stuff so i think you know in terms of behavior nothing like app usage wise um but definitely, it's just tough to afford subscriptions for a lot of people, and I think it's like, you know, pretty ob pretty obvious probably. But um, yeah, that that's been difficult. And then we do a lot of, I mean, most of our growth is organic, but we do experiment with paid. Um, and I saw someone else, I think it was fabulous, mentioned like you're just getting like lower quality or different users in, so. Um, 
you know, we had to make some adjustments on that front because we actually noticed like differences in the onboarding behaviors and then it was just all UA related. So it's like, yeah, okay, let's like fix that or turn that off. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's tricky. I mean, I think just top of mind is definitely how do you find good monetization models given, you know, the ec economic circumstances. Yeah, so. that makes sense. Well, we have a couple of minutes left, so we're going to turn it over to questions. <laughs> um, one of the top questions is, is there a future for web subscription payments? <laughs> I think we, we, we've talked about Classic. this with, with Apple's changes and, and, and how are you doing web payments? Is that a model? How do you push people there? Right? How do you communicate that? Um, David, I, I bet you have a lot. <laughs> we could probably spend and, another session talking about we this. We could talk but, like two hours but, uh, on this. Uh, but, yeah. I, I mean, super high level. Um, the, the kind of best practices right now, talking to a lot of different developers, is that take the low-hanging fruit you can in the app. It's so easy. You pay with your face. Conversion rates are generally higher. Um, and then send your highest intent users, like a win back, a discount, uh, a, a seasonal promotion, um, you know, any traffic that you, you have determined is really high intent, send that to the web and, and you will save some, um, but, but you gotta really find, find the right balance because you, you know, most apps, and, and there's a lot of skewed numbers out there because people are like, oh, my, you know, our web conversions are the same percentage as, as our in-app conversions, and, but you're not actually measuring one-to-one -one because the web is getting a 30% discount or, or it's, it's like the seasonal promotions or like you're sending very skewed traffic. Um, so so for, for, don't think the web is like this magic unlock that, oh, I'm gonna save 30%. And then, I mean, there's all the things like if it's a $2 a month subscription, you know, you can't push them to the web, a 30 cent transaction fee and 3%, like you're losing money on the 30% there. Um, so just evaluate it for your own app of like, what's this best, smartest traffic to send to the web, and what's maybe the lower intent traffic that you can capture the conversion better in the app. And then all the experience stuff, like if your onboarding is so much better in the app, then you could do a web onboarding, like yeah, we could talk a whole like two hours on that. <laughs> but yeah, you know, figure it out for your app, but lowest hanging fruit is send the highest intent users to the web if you can. Okay. And then last question from the audience, is it worth trying to convert users who churn after day zero? For yeah. sure, yeah. I mean, I guess maybe it depends on the type of paywalling. Like, if you do like a hard paywall and like day zero, they don't get through it. I would like, yeah, there's probably not a lot of value. But if you have a freemium app and you know they're, well, I don't know if they mean subscription churn or just like user churn, or I guess they're kind of the same in a lot of ways. But um, yeah, definitely. I mean, we've seen people convert later in their life cycle. Still a ton of, a very high percentage are in that first week, first day, but um, I think there's opportunities everywhere, and once I get to some of these other journeys, I think that'll still help. So, uh, like why, I guess you just have to assess it, context is everything, like, you know, if you, yeah, you just have to look at the, it should be a pretty low lift experiment to see too, like, do people actually, like why did they not subscribe, or why did they not um, come back the next day, and then, um, I'm sure some apps are very successful at this and some that are like the hard paywall, like, yeah, you, know, you can't even get in this app. Again, I, I would see them struggling to get users back after day zero because that's a pretty aggressive, like, yeah. doors open or closed yeah. type deal, you know, so. Yeah. We're gonna, I'll speed run some numbers because I think you'll all, all find this really interesting. And we're gonna probably release benchmarks on this, but, um, for anyone who's ever started a free trial, the resubscribe rate across all of our data is 5%. So the opportunities for winbacks is actually pretty, pretty low overall. It's 6% on iOS, it's less than 1% on Android. So if anybody who ever started a free trial on Android, 0.6% ever came back and resubscribed, super low. Um, but there are certain categories that do really well. Kids apps, there are some kids apps with like 
double digit resubscribe rates because parents will subscribe for a little while when their kids are young and then they have another kid and they come back. Mm. So I think it depends, it's very contextual, but when I saw that number, I was actually really surprised because I thought there was a bigger opportunity in winning back these people who started a free trial and then ended up canceling. And, and it's not super low hanging fruit, but it depends on your category. And for some, for some categories and some apps, it's like low single digit percentages even on iOS. So, yeah. Well, yeah. well, that's pretty interesting. Well, thank you everybody for joining. I know we're up on time, but thank you to our guests for joining on stage. And I hope everyone has a nice rest of your day. And uh, I think it's drinks time, so enjoy. Yeah.